Welcome to HD Nation Tech Feed Edition, your guide to the best in home theater and HD, no matter what your budget is, high end, low end, mid price, affordable or extravagant. We have been called a little too low end recently. <laughs> we will be correcting that in future weeks. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. And look, we got a bunch of fun stuff for you today. Is it a sound bar or a 3.1 system? And WTF is a 3.1 system. Rob's looking at the latest affordable sound setup from Panasonic. We got a ton of your questions from finding deals on Blu-rays, 5.1 versus 7.1, and 3D viewing angles. And we got a great tip from one of our viewers on finding headphones that enhance the virtual surround sound experience, or what I like to call the not waking up the spouse and the children when you're watching, you know, Coppers. Domestic or, tranquility? Yeah. The advancement of domestic tranquility. <laughs> but you first. want to watch The Matrix at 4 a.m. without pissing off the neighborhood? We can help. Night mode. Yeah, anyway. But first, did we mention we have a ton of questions today? Like this one from at Scotty Pie, or Scott E. Pie? I think so. Scotepi. Scotepi. That's even better. Who tweets at HD Nation? What are your thoughts on refurb TVs from sites like uh, Woot or Newegg and others? Well, Funny you should ask. Uh, my projector is a refurb. I love refurbished gear if it comes with a factory warranty, and that's a big deal. Yeah. If it comes with a factory warranty and it has a decent discount over the regular price. Open box sales from certain big box stores that may or may not have yellow and blue involved in them, I've noticed tend to be returns that may or may not work and may or may not have all the parts in the box and is often priced way too close to full retail. If it sells for 200 bucks and they're selling it for 190 bucks and you're not sure if the parts are in the box or they tell you that like, you know, the power cable is missing or the, the volume knob is missing, I would back away from it. This is a caveat emptor situation. Let the buyer beware. I've bought refurbished gear from Optoma, Apple, Dell, and several other sources. Uh, it's often returns that have barely or never been used. The factory looks them over. Basically, the manufacturer looks them over, gives it the big thumbs up, gives it a warranty. I have been extremely happy. Or, or lucky, but that's a good point, True. though. The factory re refurb stuff has been gone over by the factory, and they yeah. check that all the parts are there and that the machine actually works. If you're doing that from a big box store, it could be the opposite, like Patrick mentioned. They, they will probably put everything in the box. Hopefully, yeah. it's up to you to make sure that it's all there before you leave the store. Otherwise, you might have trouble, say, getting a power cord or yeah. a remote that wasn't there, or let alone that yeah. little crack you didn't see when you looked in the box. Well, saving 50 bucks on a Blu-ray player and then having to buy like a hundred dollar universal remote control because the Blu-ray player didn't have a remote <sighs> in the box can be incredibly frustrating. I also got to say, I love used gear. Back in the day, the Stereo Exchange in Manhattan, which apparently is still at 627 Broadway downtown near NYU, got me hooked on audiophile gear because they had used gear that I could actually afford. Um, you know, look, if it's not coming from a friend or a small shop that vets their gear, you probably want to see it in action, but it can be a nice gateway to gear that would otherwise be out of your price range. I have a ridiculous sound system in my truck that I got off Craigslist. You know, retail price, even at, like, not MSRP, but like actual street price would have been about $2,000 worth of speakers. I paid about 700 for it. You know, if you want to spend all the money and you have all the money, go for it. But used and refurbished can be a great gateway into getting good gear for less than you would pay otherwise. Awesome. Big, the big OLED TVs are coming. <laughs> HD Guru reports that Korean Yonhap news agency that Samsung will ship its 55-inch OLED TV in Korea next week. The KN55 F9500 will be about $8,780 US. That's 10 million won. It's a lot of good. won. It is a lot of won. And if we're talking about OLED, we're talking about organic light emitting diode TVs. Now, yeah. basically, Samsung told HD Guru that the panels will show up in the US in the second half of 2013. Apparently, OLED yields are up from or up to about 60% this year from about 20% last year. And these are going to be expensive for quite a while. If you consider that every TV they're making, 80% of them weren't working, and now they got it at least up to 60% that now, are working. Now only 40% of them go into oh, the scrap heap. Holy cow. Why is OLED like the grail? Like because OLED technology promises you that you can print it out or make it flexible, or why? Why, partially. why do we want it? Performance, number one. Uh -huh. When there is, it's an emissive display technology, meaning that the light that you see is actually being emitted close, very close to the surface of the display compared Ooh. to say, LED technology or LCD technology where the TVs are actually pushing light through layers of plastic. That affects viewing angle, mm -hmm. that affects efficiency. The other thing is performance, I mentioned, high-speed pixels uh, compared to say the, the current standard, which is plasma. OLEDs have at least that performance in addition to when it can produce pure black, it is it is pure black. It is not Better muddled, than plasma? muddied gray. Well, the latest plasmas are getting pretty darn good if you spend a little money, yeah. but OLED promises to have that in even thinner, lighter forms. Right. 
And that's really the main benefit. A few years out, OLED should drop off a cliff price-wise and become considerably more affordable, or it won't. We, 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 we wait with bated breath. Good news from everybody's favorite low-cost quad HD TV manufacturer or 4K HD TV manufacturer or ultra HD TV manufacturer, <laughs> Seiki. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, they have a new firmware update you're very excited I, about. You know what? For that 50-inch model, if you purchased it on their page right now, they do have a new firmware update for it. The other news being that they're now going to be shipping later this month, which is only a week left in the month, but the 39-inch version of the TV that will have 4K resolution as well. And they have a 65-inch version coming later in the year, but that's going to be pretty cool. If, if you wanted the smaller size, that 39-inch version at 4K resolution right. or, or Quad HD, that could be the kick butt personal display for maybe a supersized computer display. I, I, all I'm thinking is like... Jai, that's 39 inch 4K. That's that's my next. That is now my next. The, the yeah. Just, I want that on my desktop. Screw too. the 30 at, inch. <laughs> at least for working with video, because the frame rate's still going to be at 4K resolution. Right. You're still limited to about 30 hertz or less. Oh wait. So, oh, gaming's out. Forget it. Yeah, I'm it's not going it. to be a gaming display. For, nope. At least at Sorry. 4K resolution. I can but wait till next year. That's the same TV we showed though, running at 1080p 120, which might be in, of interest to some people who are connecting computers to it. After the show, I'm going to be updating the 50-inch version with the new firmware to see what it fixes. Right. We really like it when we see a manufacturer, especially one that we're not real familiar with, releasing firmware updates because that means they're supporting their products at least now. I mean, how many times have we seen like a router where they released no updates? It gets shipped and ignored. And yeah. if there are issues, they weren't addressed. And this is at least a sign that Seiki's stepping up and saying, you know what? There were some issues with the initial shipping product, but here, here's an easy <laughs> firmware update. Granted, it's not a net-enabled TV. I'm going to have to stick a, a USB drive in it. But that's not that difficult nowadays. And we should give props to uh, at Looney Boy, aka Jason Bergman, for the heads up on the new $700 4K TV, which again will be 30 hertz. Great for video, not so good for uh, video gaming. Totally. Good movies, not so good for video games. Oh, indeed. Hey, before we start getting all uh, hot and heavy on AVR and speaker reviews in the next few weeks, yes, we're going to class up the joint with some more high-end gear. And I wanted to review one of the more affordable audio systems and drop in a little PSA right now. TV speakers suck compared to even the most <laughs> modest soundbar, let alone the many affordable and capable surround sound systems that are available today. Now, one benefit of adding a soundbar to your home theater is to improve the perception of dialogue, be it for the hard of hearing or someone learning a second language or somebody who just wants vocal clarity, which brings us to the Panasonic SC HTB 770 home theater system. It brings vocal clarity in a uniquely flexible set of speakers. Let's take a look. So this is pretty funny. It looks like a sound bar, but you can break it apart. It comes with a pair of speaker stands. The center channel is this kind of big metal armature that assembles the two, the left and right channels, and the center channel. This is unusual. We don't really see 3.1. Totally. Um, it's, it's very flexible. In a sense, you get the center channel with left and right with a bracket system and additional options for, for either making them separates or a complete sound bar or hardware for mounting on the wall as well. Now, the package includes a separate amplifier, which basically provides the 3x1 HDMI switch. So you have three ports in, one port out to your HDTV. A couple of optical inputs also for connecting your classic audio devices. And like everything else nowadays, there is Bluetooth for streaming lossy audio uh, from your phone to your home theater device. And the world's most semi-useful USB port. <laughs> for firmware updates only, apparently. Okay. At least it says for service only. I saw uh, no firmware updates yet. Okay. Uh, the speaker setup, as we mentioned, is 3.1 channels for a total of 300 watts of power RMS. 60 watts actually to the left, right, and center channels that handle your mids and highs. The pleasantly punchy sub, it's wireless by the way, gets the other 180 watts. And for the speaker setup, it's two and a half inch speakers, one inch tweeters, and the sub is actually a six and a half inch down firing sub, which, like I said, pretty punchy for that. Now, like we mentioned, the big deal for this setup is really the speaker configuration options. Separates, the sound bar, hung on the wall, or standing any way you want. You can plug that sub in because it's wireless pretty much anywhere as well, which makes uh, it all the easier to get it configured for your particular your home theater configuration. So the dialogue was good. The subwoofer was solid for a six and a half inch subwoofer. How about the car chase, surround sound, boom, gunshots, and explosions? Now, I'm used to having a couple of speakers either to the side for the right. surround channel effects or even slightly behind me. This doesn't have that, but the virtual side of it wasn't bad. I, I still would prefer the full 5.1 treatment or better uh, in terms of, or more I should say, not necessarily better, but for what it does, the convenience of it, and for displays, I'd say up to about 65 inches wide, uh, at least for the soundbar configuration, mm -hmm. if you split it, you can make it, you know, put them anywhere you want that way. 
audio was really good. And the sub really filled in the lower notes too. Mm -hmm. So while the mids and the highs were handled quite well by the tweeters and the drivers in the bar, uh, if it wasn't for this sub, and this is one of the better small subs I've, I've listened to lately, actually, in terms of reproduction for, for the booms and the lows. And that was as much, I felt, uh, giving you the, the, the cinema experience as any part of the system was. That's a big thumbs up. It really was. And it, I had no complaints about it for, for what it is. This twee little box is essentially your AVR. I'm going to ignore the standard stadium music cinema news stereo presets. How was it actually for the HDMI switching? It, it, having an HDMI switch built into any new receiver is going to be a pretty common thing, and it's handy, but it could have been better on the HTB 770. You could add something like technologies from Silicon Image. They have Insta Preview and Insta Port for live input previews and for lightning fast HDMI switching between the ports, respectively. Now, this does not have that, and the switching was actually pretty slow between the HDMI mm -hmm. ports. We showed you a product in episode 214 called the DVD-O Quick 6 that is an HDMI switch that featured both those technologies, although I think the price of that switch is a little bit more than the cost of this whole system right here. I think the price of that switch is almost twice the cost of this entire it, system. It might be. Now, we also showed you that included remote. It's on the small side, no doubt. And it required actually good line of sight to that receiver in order to function consistently. And we showed you also the dedicated buttons for controlling dialogue and other, other aspects of the audio playback as well. But when you're doing input selection, there's actually very small strip of LEDs on the front of the amp that really provided no, it was very hard to see those in terms of where you were and it's only a one-way switch, so you're hitting one button and it's just cycling through all five available inputs. Oh no. <laughs> this is actually a really good reason though to invest in a programmable universal remote like a Harmony. Don't fight your home theater in situations like these. Find something to, to help make it easier for everyone. Oh my goodness, those are tiny. They, they're pretty small. And, but, you know, <laughs> if you had something like a universal remote, it really wouldn't matter because, yeah. <laughs> I hate, I hate one-way cycling systems. I really prefer direct access to, to those, but... I can't imagine why. There is also audio return channel and HDMI support for things like uh, uh, the feature where it will automatically sense what inputs are being active and switch to it for you, so that can help mitigate that a little bit, but still. Those are tiny, <laughs> tiny little indicator lights on there. But although, you don't want blinding indicator lights if they're in your home theater environment anyway, but that might be on the verge of too small. Any Remember on screen display to offset the tiny indicator uh, lights? You know, on that Vizio soundbar setup we were showing right. you earlier, the remote actually featured a little display that showed you what no, was going on. No, I mean on, on screen display. That, Why are there no on screen displays in home one. theater AVRs? <laughs> but when it comes down to it, the sound quality, it was impressive for small speakers paired with a decent sub. The system defaults to that clear dialogue mode and a press of the button enabled other sound modes like stereo output. But the default, I found, was pretty much where I left it the whole time. Now, volume levels overall, they were good for even relatively large rooms. We had it here in the studio, cranked it 100% or close to it for quite a while without any obvious distortions. And like I said, that center channel really was good at producing vo vocals and making it very clear to hear what was being said on screen. And I really felt the Panasonic's SC HTB 770 home theater system, it's good clear sound along with one of the more flexible speaker setups I've encountered in quite a while. And the few quirks I've talked about here really aren't showstoppers, and I could spe see spending quite a bit more to get something that would be quote unquote better, especially if you want if you want to add those rear channels, you're gonna have to step up with something a little bit more than this. Well, we're looking at like, what, $350? Totally, list price, I found it online for about 320, a little mm -hmm. under that, and for that, and it's, it's flexible nature. If you bought this thinking, you know what, this might go in the living room first, but then I might take it into a bedroom where the display needs the speaker separated more for either, you know, separate imaging or, or just the way you want it set up. This actually provided all the hardware needed to get that done. And, and for that, I, I found it quite unique and, and good sound quality too. And that's really yeah. the number one thing for any audio upgrade. So it's kind of funny though, but I look at this, right? And I think like I could pick up an AVR for $300. I could pick up an entry level set of, set of speakers for $300. I could start building from there. True. Or I could start with a stereo set of speakers or stereo and a center channel. Because I look at this and this is gonna do one thing. This AVR and this set of speakers, well, I, I, I guess you could wire these speakers. No, actually the, the wireless subwoofer is built into the AVR, so this is it. This, this is, is what it's gonna do. This is pretty much it. <laughs> and you do have the option though of, you know, the positioning of the speakers, and that's really the right. key point of this. And, and you are, but you are stuck with what it's stuck with, and if you don't like that type of HDMI switching, if the speed of it's gonna drive you nuts, if, you, if, you, if that's the first thing on your list, I want something that handles all of my components in lightning fast precision, this, this might not, not be the you. project for you. But uh, again, we're talking cost. At that $320 price point, you're getting, you're getting a good entry-level audio system and experience out of it. Next week, we start discussing AVR picks. Yep. Get ready. <laughs>
<laughs> to get full 5.1 surround sound in a serious way. For everybody rounding out their collection of James Gandolfini's performances, rest in peace, Tony, at Forest Roll tweets at HD Nation, where is the best place to buy Blu-ray for the best price? Oh my goodness. Da -dun, da -dun. Well, it's kind of funny. Um, right now, I, I would, I, I dare say Amazon is taking names and kicking ass in overall costs. And oh, look, wait a minute. We actually have Star Trek Into Darkness not only as a pre order, but has a pre order price finally. I have a search set up for that that just shows me all the movies that are $10 or less. Right. And I absolutely love that. Um, there, that would be the, the biggest, most obvious one. Uh, Costco has cut down the size of their Blu-ray section. Oh. Uh, Best Buy has radically cut down. I don't. I the at least the Best Buys around here pretty much have a limited number of CDs and an incredibly limited selection of Blu-rays now. My local Target always has big bins of movies on sale, right. so I'm always looking through there just to see if there's something I wanted to add <laughs> to the collection or something I'm missing. Yeah. And anytime I can see that that sub ten dollar price point for a Blu-ray, if it's something. I actually want and will watch. Otherwise, I'm not wasting my money. But grab yeah, it. I mean, traditionally, like Walmart, Best Buy, Target, they were using uh, Blu-ray discs or DVD discs or CD-ROM discs, what they call or CDs, not CD-ROMs, but CD music CDs, as lost leaders. Like, I'm going to buy a CD for $7. And I'm going to buy $400 worth of candy, and they made a whole bunch of money. Um, you know, Walmart and Best Buy and Costco are reducing the size of those Blu-ray sections. What's kind of interesting is the best deals on Blu-rays is to not buy it the day it releases, to not pre-order it for the day it releases, but wait a couple months afterwards. Because a lot of times, six months after a Blu-ray has been released, you'll find it for $10 dollars or seven dollars at Costco or 7-Eleven or Wawa in your in the Northeast or at a truck stop or at your local supermarket because they're everywhere now and the longer you wait to buy it the cheaper the price is gonna get. Yeah until it gets that hundred year restoration and then the price goes back up but that's in the future. Then you get the cool 8k transfer. That's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a viewer question from F4H33M97, I'm sure that says something, but I can't quite figure it out. <laughs> Could someone help me with 3D viewing angles, uh, vertical and horizontal for passive and active? Well, that's a really good question, actually. One issue with the early version of passive 3D technology was related to the film type patterned retarder technology that splits the lines of the video right. on the screen between the left and the right eyes. That layer was initially much thicker than it is today, and if you moved off axis, either in horizontal or vertical, it would result in distracting double images. Uh, this issue has not gone away entirely, uh, but the use of much thinner films has reduced this artifact and widened that 3D viewing sweet spot. It sounds really silly, right? As I'm sitting here like, if you go too far, you get double image. But the reality is, is if your couch is close enough to your HD TV, the people at the left and right ends uh, by the armrest can actually have difficulty seeing the 3D in that situation. And one thing you can do is just simply move the seating position back a little bit, if possible, or practical. Right. Now, active technology, the glasses that are liquid crystal shutters that flash back and forth, providing a solid view with each eye. The one eye gets closed, the other guy gets visible. Anyway. That can be even worse in a sense that when head tilt, head tilt is factored in. You won't see anything with any pair of active 3D glasses if you're lying sideways on the couch like so. Now, with either 3D tech, tech try to minimize those off-axis viewing situations to only one axis, either horizontally or vertically. If you do them both, like say, oh, I'm not only sitting below the screen but off to the side, the errors become cumulative and it makes it even worse to look at. <laughs> uh, the other thing to keep in mind with either 3D technology is that the more centered you are to the seating position, the more light will reach your eyes. And that's something that's important for a good 3D reproduction and viewing experience, since the glasses by their very nature are restricting the light that's hitting you in the eyes anyway. Now, we talk about wall mounting all the time. Here's where a wall mount can help minimize these artifacts by basically allowing you to adjust the angle of the TV so you can angle it right at your face and to get a better view. And that's, that's about it, really. <laughs> that's just uh, some of the basics for that. And, and Basically, what he's saying is you want to be right here. It is. And, and the farther off from here you get, the worse things get. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and I will say, the newer TVs are doing a much better job across the yeah. board than I've noticed uh, with past, the earliest generations of 3D2. It, it's tough to be an early adopter sometimes. Painful, even. Richard19 Amoa comments, Hey guys, I want to thank you for assisting me in my new 55-inch Sony television purchase. You got a W900A. Oh. The size increase suggested made a lot of sense in your previous episode. Excellent. My question is about sound. I am an insane audiophile that smiles when I hear lossless audio, especially in the Transformers films. I currently have a 5.1 AVR and a couple of Blu-rays that have 7.1 audio. Is an upgrade to a 7.1 AVR beneficial, or is my 5.1 AVR good enough for the show? Thanks. 
So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. To make sure everybody understands what those last two 7.1 channels are, we're up on Dolby. And basically, if you're in a theater with surround sound, you have regular 5.1 surround sound. Um, you've got a center channel, a left channel, a right channel, a subwoofer positioned in a way that you cannot tell where it is. And then left surround is basically in a theater. They have a big old fat honking array of speakers. In your house, it's basically going to be right about here if this is your row of seats opposite your screen. So this would be the right surround, the left surround. 7.1 adds the back surround left and the back surround right. So There are a handful of movies that do support 7.1 audio. Right. However, most, the majority of movies out there are currently authored in 5.1 yeah. audio. So your current setup should be sufficient. Now, if you've not tuned your speaker setup in a while, or ever, <laughs> double check the positioning and aiming. Yeah. Levels and timing are also important, and these are relatively easy tweaks that can make a big difference in the, in the overall quality of your current yeah. setup. And it's a good way to evaluate whether or not it should be time to maybe start shopping for more speakers or, or better speakers. Better Upgrade speakers. the speakers maybe before you go spending money on the new AVR. Evaluate what you have and yeah. get the best value for your money that you're going to spend. Are there any other features you want to have a new AVR? Are you in a really peculiar shaped room where something with a, a multi-EQ, Odyssey style multi-EQ audio, like I used to have the worst room on the planet because there was just, it was a big L-shaped room and the echoes made surround sound a nightmare. The multi-EQ cleaned that up in a really, really big way. Um, we said it before, we'll say it again, you know, wattage in 7.1. Wattage definitely are, are the worst reason for upgrading an AVR, probably followed by uh, 7.1. Yes, unless you're Although, also looking to, a lot of those 7.1 or, or greater systems that support more speakers will do multi-zone right. too. So if you need to drive, I want to have separate audio going to the bedroom, separate audio for the living room. If you're in one of those situations, right. that might be a reason to upgrade. Just one other, one other trick you can do with <laughs> multi-speaker systems. Think about speaker upgrades though. Yeah. Cody Miller sends in a handy link. He said, you were talking about headphones and in particular virtual surround sound. Well, he says, I came across a thread on HeadFi by Mad Lust Envy. The thread has reviews for over 40, 40, 40 pairs of headphones. Or zero. I don't talk with my hands much. Nice. The thread is directed towards gaming, but he does a good job of reviewing the headphones for their overall quality. You will need a device to create the virtual surround sound in the first place for many of these headphones, like a sound card or AVR, and some may require an amp. So it's pretty cool. Mad Lust Envy's Headphone Gaming Guide, updated 523, 2013. Mr. Speaker's Mad Dog V. 3.2 reviewed. Nice. So it's pretty cool actually. It's a good read if you're thinking about getting your surround sound headphones on. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. Mostly stereo headphones talks about how good they are for gaming. Take advantage of somebody doing all this hard work. Yes. One more thing before we go, if you want to learn about sound diffusion and how it might help out your viewing room, check out this crazy, this wonderful write-up. Um, TechnologyTel.com has a guest post from Cedia called Cedia Project Highlights from a Garage to Sound Optimized Home Theater. And uh, this is the garage, and this is what the inside of the garage looks like now. Holy cow. Holy cow. <laughs> well, That's what's really awesome. funny is that crown Surprise. molded up top. Does it, this. Still, does it still have the roll the garage door opener? I don't know, to and I don't care. Probably what, not. What I was fascinated by is, is there's a really interesting story about why they put these up here. Uh, and how it basically makes things sound better. If you want to read the article, technologytel.com is the website. I highly recommend it if you want to learn more about tune in a room or how a room, basically the room you put your home theater in is impacted by the room itself. Totally, and, and options for treating the walls in such a way to either minimize problems that you're having or make the system just sound better overall or to preserve that domestic tranquility so you're not blasting into other rooms or, or sending the sounds you don't want I'm other places you. at home. Honeycomb ceilings, the future. Forget about plastic, it. it's all about honeycomb ceilings. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that diffusion of sound. Perfect. And with that, we're done, people. We gotta run. That's it for this episode of HD Nation Tech Feed Edition. Please subscribe in Tech Feed or go to revision3.com slash HD Nation to get our show in your YouTube lineup or subscribe in your favorite podcatcher, iTunes, or wherever else you like to watch the shows. Do it. And that's right. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions right down below. And until next time, thank you for watching.